Welcome everyone and uh, well done for getting here despite the heat. I know there'll be a lot of people away with the long weekend. So we pray safety on those guys and hydration. Um, if they're out there, especially if they're camping, that will be a long weekend to remember, I reckon. Uh, we'll see. So I'm going to continue on. The last few times I've uh, spoken, I've talked about Kingdom Revelation. I'm going to continue to do that today. And I want to talk about a renewed mind. Um, we often hear that in Christian terms, Romans 12.2. But what does it actually mean? Because the mind has a big impact on how we behave and how we move forward. I remember a story, it's, it's one I actually laugh at more than anything. Um, but I can remember years, years ago, you know, as I've said before, it was just a little bit after the T-Rex was extinct, uh, when I was young. Um, I remember playing tennis, and I used to play tennis as a kid. And we lived in the bush, so we didn't, I didn't go very often to uh, Melbourne to play and stuff like that. So I tended to play there. And I remember once playing in uh, Shepparton, at a tournament there, and I came up against the young bloke who at the time was, I think, number two in Australia. He was the best player in Victoria. And I remember coming against him, and all my mates said to me beforehand, in fact, I think they all said sucked in, if I remember rightly, something similar. Um, it wasn't positive, anyway, I remember that. And I remember at the time thinking, why? I actually said to them, why? He hasn't beaten me before. He ain't number one till he's done that. <laughs> and I think they looked at me slightly bewildered um, because it was possibly a mixture of arrogance, but it was a genuine thought. I actually genuinely thought, he's only got two arms and two legs. What's he going to do? It's still a racket and it's still only a ball. One of us has got to win. Why can't it be me? That was my logic. Didn't necessarily help, I might add. <laughs> he did actually beat me, but I actually pushed him very close, actually. But, and my mates would actually say it was that attitude that actually got me much closer than you'd think was possible. But I've never forgotten it, and certainly these days, I'd hope I'd be a bit more uh, humble about it, but it made me think mindset actually matters. Mindset matters. Please don't think I'm going down the path here of positive thinking type stuff. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying the way we look at things, the way we perceive things actually does have an impact on how we then behave. That's what I'm saying. Okay, yep. So God's word tells us that our minds must be renewed. So this is Romans 12.2. You all know it well. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Note this, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. See, the mind doesn't just matter physically, it also matters spiritually. We need our minds to be changed. They need to be renewed if we are going to walk in God's ways as disciples. And we can't do it through positive thinking and all of that stuff. It actually needs a spiritual change. Only the Holy Spirit can actually renew our mind. I want you to think back to the Gospels. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees from John. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. See, without the Holy Spirit, we can look on something, study it deeply, think we totally get it, and actually 
have no clue whatsoever. These are the Pharisees, these are the guys who were brought up in the law, the Jewish law. These are the guys who'd been through the rabbinical schools. They knew the scripture inside out, so they thought. And yet here's the Messiah standing in front of them and they cannot recognize him. So you need the Holy Spirit to have a renewed mind, to be able to see what God is putting in front of you. His truth and his love are both essential in that. He gives us both. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We need the Spirit. We need the Spirit to reveal his love and his truth. When that happens... The Spirit helps to renew our minds. John 16, 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Truth comes from the Holy Spirit. That's why we see so much stuff today and you go, seriously? Truth is relative? That's news. It might sound nice. Try it next time you're near a cliff. If you're three metres away from a cliff, if truth's relative, five metres would be the same as two, depending on how you feel, so just... Walk out five metres. See what happens. You'll soon find that truth is also has absolute in it. You can contemplate that as you're falling down. Truth matters. And the Holy Spirit tells us what truth is. And that's confirmed in the Word of God, the Scripture. But then you need also to have love. Because if you only have truth, what happens is we can end up like the Pharisees if we're not careful. If it's just truth, we can end up with a religious type spirit about things. We can end up legalistic. That's the problem with that one. We also need love for those who are led by the Spirit of God. Note this, it's the Spirit of God. Are the children of God, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. This is so much really of what Christos was saying this morning, the prophetic was so good. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. This is the love. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, that's Papa God. That's a love relationship. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, it's truth and love together. Because if you just have the love bit, then we also end up, as I call it, loosey-goosey. We just end up defining love as whatever. You need both. You need both. It's part of how God renews our mind in the Holy Spirit. I want to give an example of what can go wrong, even for godly people, when we lose track of this. Deuteronomy 17, 16 to 17a. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. See, what happens is if we don't have the Holy Spirit working in us, renewing our mind, we start to 
work things out ourselves. You would think that's a pretty clear instruction. Kings of Israel, do not do this and you'll be okay. Straightforward. But let's have a look at what Solomon did. Remember Solomon? At that time, quote, early in his life, you know, the wisest man on earth. This is what he did. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. Anyone see a slight contradiction here in the scripture? You might think, look, you might not get it after the first 2,000 stalls had been built. But I reckon 12,000 horses running around, you might notice a couple. What's going on here? Interesting too when you just look back. I heard it actually mentioned today by someone else. So it's interesting when you look back and you look at King David, how often you see horses when they defeated others in battle, horses were hamstrung. And you think that's interesting because they used to often take much of the loot and whatever. Why? I often used to think at times, oh, it must be so that they could never get the horses again, the opposition sort of, and raise up. Actually, when you think about it, no, because it was the Israelites who would have had possession of them. Why did he do that? I think because David had the wisdom to know, do not collect horses. You can't prove that. But I think David had that wisdom. Solomon had clearly forgotten it. Have a look at this one. King Solomon, however, remember, do not take many wives, was the thing. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Remember, they were also not to marry outside of the Jewish faith. Loved many foreign women beside Pharaoh's daughter. He's already gone back to Egypt. Remember, he's told not to go back to Egypt. So he's already gone back for that. Moabites, Ammonites, Edenites, Sidonians and Hittites. They were from, were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites... You must not intermarry with them because you will surely, they will surely turn your hearts against, oh, after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. There are so many questions. And I could ask Mike McMeekin for his reflection, but I won't. <laughs> I don't know how you end up with that number when the scripture clearly said, do not take many. And yet when you look at this, what do you see? There's a pattern here. What Solomon's doing is he's using earthly wisdom. He's saying, I'm going to make myself politically stable because if I take wives if I have Pharaoh's daughter I have an alliance now with Egypt I won't be attacked I'll be safe on that front I can then call on them if I need military help all of this stuff starts to look because I mean seriously I'm going to be very careful what I say here I just it's bewildering that's all I'll say 700 wives I just um, I don't know if anyone's got any comments on that later. It should be a fun time of morning tea. But it's a bit like the horses. How many would have been enough anyway? But there's so much happening here with alliances. This is so much of a political thing. Let's face it, from a relationship point of view, you can't possibly... There's only 365 days of the year. Like, there's a thousand women... It's clearly got much more to do than with personal relationships. This has got to do with political alliances and keeping strongholds there. So where's his trust in God? Think about it. He's not only now thinking his way through this, that he's going to have all this wealth, he's going to have all this stuff to protect himself in an earthly... Because I'm sure it seemed very smart have alliances with this one and that one and they won't come to war and I can call on them to help and all that. But what has he done in this? Where is God? Where's his faith in God? Where's his faith in God to protect him and the people? 
how could you look at that and go, he's keeping God's word? How could you do that? He's lost it. Why? Because his mind wasn't renewed in the spirit. He's using human logic. He's thinking about it from a human perspective. And we know what happened. For all of this, Solomon was starting to crumble. It's actually in kingdom authority that we see victories won by fighting in his power as we serve. It's not in our own strength. It's not in political alliances or our great wisdom or intellect. And that's not to say those things can't be appropriate sometimes if God's leading that way. But it is actually about God. He is the central thing. It's in him we trust. 2 Corinthians 10.4. This is Paul writing. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. He's saying they're not alliances that we make. Although God can still work through them at times. But that's not the key. He's saying on the contrary they have divine powers to demolish strongholds see the weapons we fight with are holy spirit weapons it's the power of god but that requires us to realize that we've got them we haven't done it through works they're gifts but we still need to recognize they're there I love this from the Apostle Paul, Romans 15. This is his description of his ministry. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Can you see what's there? Signs and wonders were part of his renewed mind. It's not that the signs and wonders come out of the mind. It's not like positive thinking and suddenly water turns into wine. It's not that. What it means is that when Paul sees a situation, his mind doesn't just think of an analysis that is human-based. What are the limitations? What are the potentials here within the natural order? No, he actually says, Lord, what do you say? What do you think, Lord? What do you want to do here? And that can lead you into the supernatural. That's what he's getting at. That's why he puts it right up the beginning. It's interesting how he describes it. He's talking about his go the gospel of Christ by the power of signs and wonders. Through the power of the Spirit of God. Note that. It comes through the Spirit. The power comes through the Spirit. And it's us being aware of that. Having that relationship with the Holy Spirit, being open to the Holy Spirit 24-7. That we start to move in the ways of God. That is where we see kingdom authority start to show itself. It's not just pie in the sky positive thinking. It's interesting, Jesus didn't teach his disciples how to preach. He probably might have, but there's nothing recorded. But he did teach them how to pray. Our Father in heaven. Note that, it's a collective thing, our Abba. Hallowed be your name. All awe, worship, worthy of everything, Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. 
it's possible. I'm not saying for one moment that this place is going to become like heaven now. I don't mean that. It's still broken. Sin is still here. But we can see more and more of God's kingdom breaking in. We talk often in theology of the kingdom now and the kingdom not yet. And we will live in that tension. We will live in that tension and we should. But the more and more that we actually focus on asking the Spirit to work in our minds, to keep renewing us as we repent of sin, ask Him to cleanse us if we ever fall short, what we will find is more and more we will see the Spirit working in our minds, prompting us. Suddenly things seem to change because your perspective is different because what you see normally you would analyse from a purely human perspective, that still might be there, but things change. So instead of suddenly, I've got work today and whatever, and you still do that, that's a good thing, it's a God thing, honour him in that. But in the midst of that, he might actually highlight to your person and say, just go and, just go and sit beside him. Just go and hang out with him. And when you listen to that, something opens up. It's a spiritual thing that opens up. Because kingdom authority includes the Spirit's gift of power, love and a sound mind to serve. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Because a a secular mind, a mind that's not renewed in the Holy Spirit, will look at things and go, well, there's a lot of brokenness. Well, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. That's true. And then at best, you will come up with a natural way to try and deal with it. It might be, let's try and raise money to get more doctors to help in a particular situation or whatever again. It's not, it's not wrong. But it stops at that level. It doesn't grasp that the Holy Spirit can do so much more. The Holy Spirit can take just a few loaves and fish and feed multitudes. See, the Spirit can do something It can't be done in the natural. But it's the renewed mind that understands that. As Paul says, it's the power of God. It's the Spirit of God working in me that sees signs and wonders. Those things coming down. That's heaven coming to earth. Kingdom authority in our disciples. This is what we're called to do. We are actually called. Read Mark 16 at the end. Have a look at the Great Commissions. We are called to go out there and be disciples, agents that the Holy Spirit works through to break off oppression, to see people healed, to see diseases healed. We heard a testimony only a couple of weeks ago of someone who got up here just saying, hey, had the scans, cancer. It was all confirmed going again, tissue's still there, but there's not a cancer cell to be found in the body. And when that person said, I think that might be a miracle, what do you think, doc? (laughs) And the doctor just sort of, with a wry smiles, well, you might be right. Because you don't want to totally admit it, but (laughs) this is what happens. Am I saying that we will get this right every time? No. Am I saying that every single person will be healed? No, I'm not. I'd love to be able to say it, but I'm not. Lazarus died twice. We still have the effects of sin. And that's why we rejoice in Jesus Christ. Because we know we have eternal life with him. 
But we can be agents. When we have a renewed mind in the power of the Spirit, we can be agents that will see more of heaven breaking into this place. And we will see lives changed. We will see lives changed. Again, this morning, actually, I heard someone give a testimony. I won't embarrass the person. But it was so, so encouraging. And they were just talking about how, in a major decision for them and their family, they had prayed about something, worked out which way they were going, they had done all their due diligence, but they'd handed it to God from the beginning. And it all looked like they'd done the right thing and then all of a sudden it didn't seem to be working and they got blocked in a couple of spots. They still handed it to God and then in the most amazing way, a couple of people intervened and they ended up at a point where they're just blown away by God's amazing generosity and how he took them to the most perfect place that they could never have imagined. It comes back to a renewed mind because that family, that couple realised that while God gives us human intelligence and we do due diligence and all that, and they did it right. But also there's something else. We actually have a God who loves us and will speak to us. We just need to listen. He's not the problem. If we can't hear, it means we're not listening. He will speak. He will speak. Think of Paul, the Apostle Paul, Acts 16. He's going out on his missionary trip. He knows the Great Commission, go out into all the world, preach the gospel. He's doing that. So he decides he's going to go up into Asia Minor. He's got the whole thing planned, heading up to Bithynia. And suddenly it says, and the Holy Spirit came and would not permit me to do so. Then he gets a vision, he ends up in Macedonia. The guy must have thought, what is going on, Lord? What is wrong with going up to Asia? Like, what's, 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 no, you wouldn't say what's wrong with those people. No, but he would go, hang on, if I can go out into all of the world, what's wrong with them? Seemed a good plan. I have my map ready, I'm on my way. And the Holy Spirit says something different. What does Paul do? Paul goes, actually, I've got a renewed mind. I recognise the Spirit. I thought that was a great idea, but I trust him more yeah. and I'm following him. Yeah. What happens? There was probably a point just before midnight where he probably did question it after he'd been, he was in a Philippian jail and he'd been beaten and he might have thought, what are we doing here? But we know the rest is history. The Philippian jailer the whole place shakes. The Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? He, he and his whole family baptised. That church flourishes. That's the beginning of the church in that region. Simply because Paul had a renewed mind that was open to the spirit working. It can happen. I want to finish with this point, and that is, it's easy, it's easy to walk in faith, I think, at times, when we understand what God says. Or should I say it's easier, I think. It's easier. But there are some times when he will speak, and we don't fully grasp it, but you've just got to go with it. A bit like what Paul did. I was reminded of this in the last few weeks here. Um, I won't give too much away, but anyway, went to see someone and was with another couple of people and was seeing someone who, um, in a hospital, was struggling. Anyway, was getting near the end of that time and so I did what you would hope most Christians would do. And you just say, 
Can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? Yeah, you do that sort of thing. Um, and this person mentioned a couple of things. And one thing that they actually mentioned was that they, they felt like there was a weight. They just had this weight on them. I said, fine. I said, yeah, we'll pray. And then as just a little bit more discussion happened, I was just quietly, I then actually just said, and Lord, what do you want me to pray? Because sometimes we don't even know what we need. Sometimes only the Spirit can tell us that. And I asked that, and then the most bizarre thing happened. He just said to me, this person has a python spirit over them. Break it off. And I thought, okay. Didn't see that coming. Um, now, python spirit, by the way, it's just... Demonic spirits, we just call them by the name of their impact. So Jesus used to say deaf and dumb spirit. It doesn't mean it's their natural name. But it's, it, we describe them by what if they do. This sort of spirit can often feel like, has a range of issues, we won't go into that today, but it's one that can bring, you can feel like you can't move, almost compressed. So I said, fine, Lord, I don't understand this at all. But all good, that's fine, in for the ride. So I did, just prayed. There was no sort of circle dancing or anything, no yelling, screaming, yodeling or any other type of expression. It was really simple because actually all you need is the name of Jesus Christ. Um, the volume doesn't matter, it's the power of the name. You don't have to scream it. You just have to say it with authority. And so I did. Prayed it. I could understand, sort of with the symptoms a person said, whatever, but I thought, okay. And it was fine. At the end of that prayer, the person then said, I feel much freer. So I thought, that's interesting. Man, yeah, it's positive, good. Praise God. And then they said something that just blew me away. They said, in the middle of your prayer when you said that, I started to pray in tongues. I haven't been able to pray in tongues for the last four months. And it happened at that moment. And I was thinking, wow. So I just left them and said, keep praying. Don't stop. Keep praying. It's having a renewed mind that is open to the Holy Spirit, even when sometimes we don't understand do I understand the theology of all that? No. Do I care? No, not really. Not really, because he's God and I'm not. And thank praise God I don't have to try and be that. What I have to do is listen and obey in love. That's all I've got to do. It's actually really simple. Well, it sounds simple, except when I keep wanting to go the other way. But that's actually, it comes down to that. When he says something, do it. It's really simple. And if you're uncertain if, if it's him, and you should know anyway, to be honest. I'm now talking to anybody over 45, probably. A few of you are probably just sitting there going, oh, I might just qualify. Um, do you remember the old telephones? This is before mobiles and all that. When people used to ring and you'd, the landline and... You know, you'd pick the thing up. You used to have a curly thing there. Do you remember when you used to know the voice of a lot of people? Because you didn't have who was ringing. So you'd actually recognise your voice if it was mum or dad ringing or someone, uncle. You'd recognise the voice. It's the same with the spirit. You recognise his voice when you hear it enough. But always test. Always test it with the scripture. Because he will never contradict the scripture. Right, so always test it. But we need to be open to it. We need to be open to him because it's in being open to the Holy Spirit. That is where kingdom authority comes because it, he not only fills us with power, as Paul says, and signs and wonders, but what happens is by renewing our mind, we start to actually think of him as a possibility in a situation. It's when you get caught up in a situation where you think, actually, there's no way out of this. It's just not working, or whatever it is, that the Holy Spirit can prompt you and go, actually, 
do this. And quite often you might think, that's crazy. But it'll work. If he's saying it, it'll work. It'll work because I think sometimes he just likes to show off. No, but it's just God is good. He is amazingly good. And he, he loves us. We're his kids. It's in that relationship. When we realise that, that love he has for us and the spirit of truth working together, always confirmed in the scripture, that we will really see and experience the spirit working through us, that renewed mind that will see us walk as disciples in kingdom authority. When we do that, like Paul says, we will have the same testimony. By signs and wonders, we have preached the full gospel of Christ. That's my encouragement for all of us. Press in. Press into the, to the Spirit. Listen to Him. Because you don't have to look out too far to see this world needs Him desperately. It is a broken world. And there is only one hope. Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the hope of the world.